thank you everyone for joining us today uh, to this uh, uh, hangout. Uh, my name is Dr. Al Rimal Hinai. I'm um, a general surgeon. I just finished my training from the University of Alberta, and I'm originally from the Sultanate of Oman. Um, and today, um, um, Dr. Bobel and I were going to uh, host this casual hangout. We're going to discuss an important topic in global surgery, uh, which is ethics in global surgery. Um, I will be joined by a couple of uh, teams of a couple members of our team. And I see that Kai has joined us already. Um, hi, Kai. Thank you for coming. And uh, Dr. Saleh will also join us shortly. So um, we're going to move on through this hangout by presenting a few slides at the beginning. And then the bulk of the talking will be uh, around our case discussions. And uh, Matt's going to help me organize or coordinate that as well. Um, and then at the end, we'll just move on to talk about the work that we're currently doing on ethics and global surgery here at the U of A. Um, uh, Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt. I'm a resident at the University of Minnesota. Thank you all for joining. We're looking forward to chatting about uh, global surgery ethics today. Uh, as you can see, I'm kind of in my work pajamas, and so this is very much a low-key environment. You can say whatever you want. There's no right or wrong answers. It's purely a space to kind of talk about uh, what we're thinking about these different cases. Uh, I'm really looking forward to them. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is we are considering doing more of these in like a series starting in the new year. And so if you have specific questions or topics that you would love or be interested in learning more about, uh, put those in the chat and we'll keep a list of them. Uh, Reem and I currently have a list of 10 or 15 topics already that we are starting to flesh out, but we always love more ideas. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Reem and we'll get started. Thank you, Matt. All right, so in brief, today, I'm uh, first of all, we'll discuss why do we even need to have or to talk about ethics and global surgery. I'm sure by you guys signing up for this um, hangout that you already have an interest in understanding why and maybe discussing some issues that or dilemmas that you've been through. Um, and then we'll understand the difference between what we all know, which is the biomedical ethics model and the difference between that and the relational ethics model and why that's more relevant in global surgery. And then we'll move on to the bulk of this um, hangout, which is going to be the case discussions. Um, and um, well, then we'll define the main domains of ethics and global surgery, which is me talking a little bit about our work uh, here at the U of A, at the Office of Global Surgery, and um, uh, what we are what we're going to do moving on to the future. Um, the most important goal is is potentially number five, which is um, hoping to for the participants in this hangout to develop an insight to appraise global surgical initiatives and any potential uh, unintended consequences consequences of these efforts. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta uh, respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. I would also like to acknowledge uh, that Dr. Abdullah Saleh just joined us. He's uh, the head of the Office of Global Surgery, and he's also the lead on our project of ethics and global surgery, and uh, I'm happy to have him here to also help us with the discussion part. My pleasure. Thanks for I like the disclosure. It's like <laughs> <laughs> he's <know>. here. <laughs> All right. So, um, why do we need to talk about ethics and global surgery? Um, basically, as a group, this all sort of uh, started by the thought of the good deeds that people all around the world are trying to do within global surgery that can potentially go bad. An example that I like to bring up is Tom's shoes. Um, we all know, potentially most of us know about them and we know their model or what used to be their model, which is you buy a shoe and then someone else gets a shoe for free. And everyone was excited about this and it was a great idea until people started uh, figuring out what the potential harm from donating free materials to people in underserved populations that could potentially harm their economy, availability of jobs, and basically increase the potential waste in the environment. And what the I, I really like this quote because 
it's true that what the eye doesn't see and the mind doesn't know doesn't exist. And so if we don't actually dissect our efforts within global surgery and think about what could be the potential harm in them, we will never know. Um, some examples, and I will not go into detail here because that's the, the discussion part, but uh, basically um, we've noted, uh, noticed as a group that a lot of short-term short surgical missions specifically impact negatively local communities in terms of bias and patient selection, environmental impact, um, the burden on the local healthcare system, and all these issues were not really structured. No, no one had a sort of structure to figure out why these issues were happening and, and how can we work around them. And so that's where uh, the importance of ethics um, came about. Basically, as you guys know, as the field of global surgery exponentially matured over the past uh, decade, and specifically since the Lancet Commission, um, the more efforts there, there are, the more ethical dilemmas that will come along with them. If we don't have clear ethical guidance, it, it leads to dilemmas, as uh, some of us may have already experienced. We are hoping um, at the end of our efforts, once we talk about this after the, the case discussions, to unify directions in global, surgery, in, in global surgery collaborations and avoid these conflicts. Therefore, having a structured framework is going to serve as a tool uh, to guide our collaborative efforts on every single level. So why don't we just follow the bioethics model? Because we are all familiar with it. It's a, it's a model that all of us have studied at some point in medical school, and we continue to use on a day-to-day -day basis with our patient-doctor relationship. Um, and it's great. However, um, looking at the complexity of relationships in global surgery, uh, only using the bioethics model to uh, examine ethical dilemmas is not enough. Um, and um, it, it may be very helpful, like I said, in the doctor-patient relationship, but on multi-level, institutional, collaborative efforts, research projects, um, um, things like in donation um, issues, just using that model is not enough. And so after discussing with our ethics group here at the U of A, um, we decided to follow more of uh, the relational ethics model, which is essentially answering what is fair within a relationship and in, in both or in, in all the parties that are involved in this relationship, what is the best decision that will cause the least harm to everyone involved? I like really like this quote um, and it, it sort of follows along the concept of the relational ethics, which basically says that I can only answer the question, what am I to do if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself part of? So in global surgery, um, a dissecting an ethical issue uh, is not one sided. It's, it's, it's variable. It has multiple stakeholders involved in it. And depending on where, where you are in this relationship, there's going to be dilemmas and issues related to you uh, and, and, and related to the other party or person that you're uh, involved with. And what is the right answer in that circumstance? And that's what we're trying to dissect and, and discuss here today. So enough of me talking. Uh, moving on to the more exciting part of this, uh, which is the case discussion. So, we, so we prepared two case discussions that were derived from our literature search when we did our scoping review on ethics and global surgery. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start the case discussions is um, if um, you're, you're more than welcome to comment in the chat box if you don't feel comfortable talking on the microphone um, or on video. Um, and if you would like to um, uh, talk, and then since there's only 15 participants, you can just unmute your mic and, and start talking and uh, comment or ask questions. Okay, so um, our first case is um, more related to short-term surgical missions. So um, basically a, high, a, a team from a high-income country embarks on a, on a surgical mission to a low-income setting to operate on children with congenital heart disease. Resources are limited and the local resources only have a temporary ICU and OR, which will enable them to perform only 10 operations on 10 children. Over 100 show up to the clinic and the team plans to operate only on children whose heart disease can be safely cor corrected um, with limited monitoring after surgery. 
Um, you see a patient that's a seven-year-old girl with an untreated congenital heart disease, and in a normal circumstance and in a higher income situation, she would have been operated on by the age of one. But because she has been untreated for seven years now, her condition will be too difficult and too risky to operate in a resource-limited setting with only one temporary OR and an ICU. And so therefore, um, the team has decided that it will be futile to operate on this child. And unfortunately, that might will potentially mean that she will pass away in, in the near future. So based on this case discussions, we'll move through these. These questions are, are serving essentially as a guide. But as we mentioned, this is a casual discussion hangout. So if you guys have any other questions, comments, please feel free to say so. Um, and so we can start with the first question. How does one decide who to operate on given limited time and resources? Again, just unmute and, uh, and start talking or you can also use the chat box. Hi, this is Nelly Thank you for uh, kicking off this discussion. Um, I would say in this particular case, they made it a little bit easier for us because <laughs> Um, and the seven-year-old girl has already kind of stated that even if she gets the operation, she's probably not going to survive after it. Um, mm -hmm. And the the Tupper, so obviously I would pick someone who would survive after the operation. But I think when you get into the Tupper decisions, it's um, when you have maybe comparing two patients who would both survive after but uh, if you operate on one, it would take so many of your resources that you don't have enough resources to operate on another. I think that gets into a little bit of a, a trickier situation where then you have to decide, are you trying to give uh, as many children a chance at survival as possible? Or are you trying to give the sickest uh, children a, a chance of survival as possible? Especially if you're thinking in your mind that, oh, I'm going to be back in, I don't know, two months, three months, four months. So maybe I can do the sickest ones now and the less sick people I can treat later. So I think a lot of it depends on, and not just in the now, but what do you anticipate to happen in the future? And what do you anticipate to be the possibility of these patients being able to actually come back to where you are in the future? Those are uh, great points. Thank you for your input. And, and I like how you sort of divided them. So yeah, for sure, the seven-year-old girl, maybe it's a little bit of an easy decision to make, but what about the 10 others, the 10 kids that uh, that you're only, you only have the capacity to operate on 10 in this case scenario? And so then what do you do? How do you choose to assume that all these, all these children have an equal chance at survival and all the candidates for the operation they're offering? What would you do in that situation? Yeah, so for me, I'm sorry you were breaking up a bit, but I think I, I still got the gist of your question. Um, well, maybe some people didn't. If you want to repeat it, I saw someone put a question in the chat. Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, is it more clear now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I was trying, what I was saying is um, it might be a little bit easier to decide for that seven year old girl who is, you know, probably very sick and not going to benefit so much from the operation. But let's think about the 10 or the 100 children that showed up that are potentially candidates and they all have equal likelihood of surviving and of benefiting from this procedure. However, you can only provide 10 procedures based on your resources. So then how do you choose? Yeah. Um, I'll just comment quickly, then I'll let other people jump in. Um, I think this was kind of towards the uh, end of my last comment about, are you anticipating that you are going to be back? Is this a one-time mission, like one and done, or are you coming back? Because if you're coming back, um, and well, I guess if you're coming back and everyone's equally as sick, then what you're trying to decide on is who will actually be able to physically come back to this particular location. Cause some people are coming from far off regions, right? So if in your mind, you're like, I'm going to try to treat as many people as possible. Let me do the ones who came from super far away and won't be able to come back. And then those who live a little bit more locally, I can treat them later. If uh, geography is out of the picture and you're saying everybody lives in the same location, everyone has the same severity of illness and you have to pick 10, 
um, uh, I would, pr and everyone can survive the same, then I would just pick the first 10 people who got there, I guess. If you don't have any criteria to separate them on. Anyone else has um, any other comments? Yeah, hi, this is Varshini. I um, just, just going off of um, everything that has been said already, I guess my first question when seeing this case scenario was like, uh, yes, you treat the, the condition or you do the surgical operation at that time, but what happens if there are like complications? What happens if, and I think there was something, there was something that was mentioned about um, long-term, like if they need long-term medications or something like that. But again, what happens if there's complications? Is that factored into these, the cost of giving care to 10 people? And like, if they do come back, does that mean that they're also addressing any complications that happen at that time? So it is interesting and it's definitely hard. And I, I thought it was interesting when um, Eliandra is saying like, just treat the first 10 people because that would just be, I guess, the fairest way to do it. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. So, sorry, I just need to fix my slides. Two seconds. Um, sorry, everybody. Here we go. I Maybe just... a brief point or something. Yeah. And uh, this, this comment, um, I think Roshini used the word fair. And I think that, that was the concept that Nelly Ange was bringing up, which is a very complex uh, you know, concept really, what is fair? Is it fair to fly across the world, spend $100,000 to organize a surgical mission and treat 10 very simple ASDs? Or is it more fair to um, anticipate which people will have the more likelihood of, you know, being successful in this operation or don't have access to that or have the necessary support uh, in terms of long-term medications that they might have, or uh, what kind of burden will the family um, incur by having the surgery? I'm not saying by not having surgery, because not having surgery will mean death. And and so this idea of fairness is is a very complex um, it's a complex issue. And and are we the right people to be arbitrarily making those decisions? And is our presence there sufficient to upset? The, that balance of fair. And, and so that, and that's the issue with, that's the complexity that these questions are by design, they're, they're made and to really have no perfect answer because that's ethics, right? But it's to really challenge these notions that, that there are um, you know, real consequences to people flying and doing this, this kind of work. Uh, they are realities that in a, in a system like a private system, People who don't have money don't get that kind of care. They have to enter into some kind of long wait list that is just more clearly made in, in a developing context, but we are up in a way changing the dynamic. And so what we are trying, if in trying to delineate what this idea of fairness is, I think it has to take a lot of accountability on both sides of us and the people receiving the group of people who are not from there but also the patient doctor relationship, the family, community and patient relationship, the dynamics of us going and undermining the, the trust in the local healthcare system by being there. And then nobody wants to get cardiac surgery with, uh, with the local team because they're just like, well, we'll wait for the Americans to show up. Like, what are the consequences? What is fair? What is right? And, and that's, I think, the, that's, that's the complexity, but also the, the nuance of this book. Thank you for your for your comment, Dr. Sah. And that's absolutely this is like I think the question of what is fair is the essence of the really flexible surgery, really in that way in the relationships about short term missions and, and other things that we're gonna discuss. Um, anyone else has any thoughts or comments? Uh, maybe about any of the other questions on the slide? Um, 
a lot of your video was just garbled again, Reem. Um, it might be helpful to turn your video off, maybe. To yeah, see if that's I'll possible. do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, is my voice clear now? Okay. Yeah, that's a lot better. Sorry about that, guys. Um, uh, but what I was saying is if anyone has um, any uh, comments on what Dr. Soleil said, or um, if you wanted to comment on any of the questions posted on the slides about the impact of these missions or short-term surgical missions on local communities. Feel free to post anything on the chat box or just unmute your mic. I um, will just briefly mention for the last bullet point, I think is an important one to consider just because everything um, kind of works within an ecosystem, right? So a lot of times we're talking about, okay, like the surgery or the post-stop care and all of that, but then it's also how does the presence of these individuals impact the non-healthcare aspects of the community in which they are? Um, when you're talking about in environmental, I don't know. You know, there's so many ways that it could be, whether uh, impacting local businesses uh, positively or negatively by having these extra dollars. And maybe when you're there and you're spending a lot of money, it's helping people. And then when you leave, then they don't have all of that extra investment that people were putting in their businesses for that short one or two week period. Um, uh, I don't know how people are getting around transportation when they're there. Are they using a uh, local, uh, companies or their own and um, how what types of vehicles are they using how is that impacting the environment like all of this other stuff um, that is just like all the different aspects that go into life that you should definitely consider um, aside from healthcare. and so I think that it's great that you included that bullet point for us to consider Thank you for, um, for, for discussing this. This is a very, very important point. And unfortunately, it's not um, well discussed. And um, even, even when we looked at the literature that exists and talking about ethics and global surgery, not many people think or talk about the environmental and economic impact of short-term surgical missions, as you mentioned, waste, um, carbon um, footprint, um, even, a team traveling from a high income country to a low income, the, 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 the travel itself is an environmental impact that we don't think about. And so I'm really glad that you that, that you brought or you discussed this point um, um, here. Um, anyone else would like to add maybe to the same in point, environmental economic impact or what do you guys think about the model of short-term surgical missions? Is it is it a sustainable model in your opinion? I think there is a comment in the box. I just wanted to make one quick point um, with regards to what Dr. Saleh said about the expectations of the local community. I think that's almost the in my, in my mind, like almost the most nerve wracking part of doing something like this, because if you go one year, you, you know, you provide care for 10 patients and then you're setting up an expectation for coming back in the future. And if something happens, like if the funding doesn't get cut or if the funding gets cut or, you know, logistics don't work out, like how does that affect your relationship with the community? Can you just go back later and be like, oh yeah, you know, sorry, we couldn't come last year here we are again, <laughs> I think it's just like, if you're making, if you if you do this and you provide that care, you have to make sure that there is some sort of sustainable component to it in order to ensure that, you know, long-term relationship with the community, otherwise it can get broken very easily. But I think there's also some a comment in the chat box, so. Yeah, and the comment uh, also is, it's sort of, uh, ties into what you just mentioned, which is in follow up. So Andrea says that who would absolutely both of these points are detrimental as 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 surgeons or as care any type of care providers following up on your patients after an intervention or a medication or something is so who 
and have Susie's don't have Marble Beach, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, maybe I'll move somewhere else. Let's continue the discussion, though. I can hear you guys. In the meantime, I do think the the conversation around our short term trips ethical or not is really interesting. Um, the more I've thought about it recently, it seems like they could be the a way to make them more ethical in some ways is to have an end date on them. So I think short term trips can be really beneficial to help with capacity building. But the goal should be to stop doing the trips eventually. Because if your goal is to stop doing the trips eventually, then you're working every time you're there to build up things rather than just going and providing clinical care. Um, so I, that's one thing that I thought about recently is how could we make short-term trips ethical or improve them? Right. I... Um, can everyone hear me better now? Yeah. Really sorry about this. I'm not sure what's going on with my internet. Um, thank you, Matt, for the comment, and, and, I, and I think that, I guess, it kind of ties to the little bit of discussion that you and I had before this hangout, and we were like, should we, is, is a, a short-term mission, uh, which is what people usually think about when we talk about global surgery, should it even continue to exist these days when we know the ethical implications of it and the potential negative consequences? What do you guys think? Dr. Sally, did you have a? Yeah, you know, I, so obviously I, I'm, I finished my adult surgery and I finished pediatric surgery, but I, I don't do surgery abroad. And that's very, um, it, it's a bit paradoxical. And I think a lot of people are like, why, why is this happening? Like, why do you have those skills and not do clinical care overseas? And I think it's because I, I think that the risk of harm is greater than the potential good that I can do from purely clinical care. Uh, and, um, and I think it's also a slippery slope and we have very finite periods of time. I like what you said, Matt, about the, the whole idea of, you know, the goal is to work yourself out of a job. But to do that, um, it, it takes a significant plan and a, a needs assessment and it needs a, a plan in place and, and partnerships and all that. And it's, it's quite hard. So like we, I ran an organization that does development work and I do develop, I build systems, I build organizations, build companies, build technologies. But, and even that is so difficult, it's so painful. Um, and <clears throat> one of the like lessons I remember learning early on meeting people at hospitals is you go in and you're like, oh, like um, let's do this project together. And they're like, oh yeah, for sure, let's do it. And then another group comes and gives them a very different project. And they're like, yeah, for sure, let's do it. And I was like, okay, you've, you've agreed to like four projects in the time span that I've been here, what is happening? And you know what they said? They said that the number of people who come here, make promises and go back and never ever set foot in this place again is so tremendously high that we have to be realistic that one, we're, we are going to have our hearts broken and promises and kept. But two, we have to be pragmatic that we, we have to cast a wide net because those that will come back, we don't know what they're going to give. And so we have to say yes to almost everybody. And when you look at that kind of power dynamic, that this is a serious problem, that like when you enter into somebody's community and you... Uh, start to learn, I think it's important. And I think that's, for me, the main distinction of doing this kind of work. You have to accept our role at the beginning, we're learners. So we go in to educate ourselves. That I think the disillusionment of like going and saying, I'm gonna change these people's way of doing things. I'm gonna introduce ERAS. I'm gonna do this like crazy stuff. They were like, okay, man, like they just wanna do a hernia surgery safely. Like let's just, just focus on small things. Uh, but how, how do you go about setting that up? It takes commitment. It takes like building trust. It took me almost eight years of working in the same place before people started to like, okay, well, this guy is like, either he's too stupid to leave. So maybe we'll, we will, which is probably the case, or 
um, maybe they're onto something. Maybe they are willing to come back and do this because it's a commitment. And so, so I think there is those elements. And uh, Virginia, I, I like what you said because it, it is important to think about the risk of letting them down of this expectation that then enters because we're so busy. We're, we all have lives. We all have changing circumstances. Then COVID happens or some crazy thing like that happens. And you're like, okay, now you're all grounded. What, Africa's shut down now? Like they're not doing anything? They're just waiting for us to show up? No, like things, they're probably doing more than we are. And so I think it's, it's very humbling to kind of look at it that way. So I, I think it's a very, uh, it's very important to look at uh, surgical missions with the very critical eye about like, sure, it's important to build relationships, it's important to build um, connections, it's important to educate ourselves. And it's important to really think of a way out. But if you are catering to the smallest common denominator, sometimes you might not make the impact you want, like dream bigger, make the plan if this is the life that you want to be engaged in or you want to step into then step step in it with people who are doing this more you know um, comprehensively and on a system level learn and then see if this is for you but going like you know fly by night kind of like operations going in and doing stuff like that is is risky both for you and for them yeah i think those are really incredible comments and i think it helps me at least remember that like as a surgeon i see myself as a fixer and so it's so easy to just want to go in and fix things when i see that they aren't doing it right or they don't have enough of this or they don't have enough of that or there's so much disease there whereas when you were framing it as thinking about how what it is from their perspective and how they view this and how they have to cast that wide net because they don't know who's actually committed versus just gonna come and go uh, is something I hadn't heard before in these discussions. Um, thank you, Matt and uh, and Abdullah for for both of your comments. I think two things I'd like to point out are um, first and something that you mentioned, um, Abdullah, was very important, which is that we in in global surgery historically i'm not saying everyone does this but there is a power differential and we go to lmic's thinking that we know better and therefore we can fix things and that in in itself that is is counterintuitive to the definition of global surgery the name global means it's equal it's everywhere it's around the world and I remember in one of the workshops that we hosted in the pre-conference workshop, the pre Bethune, uh, one of our participants says is global surgery is a partnership between equals. And so if we keep that in mind, it will mitigate a lot of the ethical dilemmas that we can face by thinking that we are here as heroes, knights to save the day, when actually People in their local communities know their community best. They know their needs best. And what we are trying to do is learn from them and try to share knowledge and exchange knowledge between each other so that we learn, but at the same time, we can also help um, the local communities learn or gain knowledge or skills that they need for their own communities. And I feel that the concept is very important because um, Neocolonialism and global surgery still exist, and it's a sensitive topic, but we need to talk about it and we need to think about it whenever we talk about global surgery. Um, so um, I will stop talking because I'd like to hear what you guys think, <laughs> uh, everyone else in this uh, hangout. Do you guys have any other comments, uh, thoughts about what was said? Yeah, I just um, want to comment about the, so a, a couple of different things. So one is in talking about mission trips in and of themselves, you can separate it from like, you know, the West going to a non-Western place uh, to uh, just like the idea of a mission trip because I'm from Cameroon and even in Cameroon, uh, we have richer areas and we have poorer areas. And uh, there's this organization called Ascovim that is led by uh, Georges Bouele. He's one of the general surgeons in Yaoundé, which is our capital. And he does mission trips um, to all of the rural areas of our country because they just don't have surgeons there. 
Um, and so even within a low middle income country, you can then start to think what is the, um, like the ethics and what is the durability and what is the necessity of having mission trips within that country to rural areas? Because it's kind of like the same thing we're discussing, but you're taking away, I mean, there's a different power differential. There's still Cameroonians treating Cameroonians, but it's richer people in poorer communities. So um, I don't know, I think breaking that down becomes challenging too, because if you say that you're not really a fan of mission trips, then I mean, those people in the rural communities don't get care, period. And, and you know, um, and I think when, when he goes and does the surgeries, I don't know that with Ascovim, they actually have the capacity to be building what would be ideal, like a, an actual hub and spoke type of system that then allows the people in the rural areas to have some sort of communication with the surgeons who are in the more central areas of the country that initially treated them um, or the capability to leverage technology then to keep people in touch post-operatively uh, and all of those things that go into building a system. Um, so that's always uh, you know, an interesting aspect to, to think about. Um, I mean, I would say just generally speaking, when thinking about global surgery, I think that to be a champion of doing global surgery ethically, um, especially because we are talking about neocolonialism, um, I personally feel like you have to be kind of a champion of all the different aspects of society too. So uh, a lot of why, if you wanna think about why, why is Africa poor <laughs> as a whole? Why is the continent as a whole poor? Then you can then start digging into all the political uh, relationships that still exist uh, with our prior uh, colonizers who have you know, left in theory, but are still controlling many of our central banks and all of that stuff. If you really are trying to, I guess, care about that, you have to, you have to care about all of the different elements is what I'm trying to say think about how the politics play into it think about how the economics play into it and think and in actually considering those things i think that it would be very challenging for a, any surgeon to go into a, a country that they're not from or not familiar with and say that i know best because there's just no way that you can know best unless you somehow have studied the entire history of that country and region and understand the economics that exist in present day and all of that. So I just, and I know that we have limited time and at the end of the day, we are doctors and surgeons first, but I think it is also important to think about all of those other elements that uh, explain why the world is the way it is today. Thank you, Nelianj. That was, uh, that was great. And it just, and that is what we felt as a group working on this on the project of ethics is it's so complex and it needs champions on multiple levels. As you mentioned there, I mean, it, it probably this champion that knows everything from and is like a professional, a health professional that knows everything from, from A to Z probably doesn't exist. And so we need to work as a team or with experts who know and, and mainly champions from local communities, like we said, who understand what their needs are best. Um, and with partners who view each other as equal and with an equal exchange of knowledge and not um, sort of um, a power differential when someone imposes something else on someone. So re really great points, Nelianj, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any further comments on this case? If not, we can move on to the second case. Yeah, we should definitely move on. I think the second case brings out a different and somewhat related to part of what Nelly Ange was talking about in terms of is no care better than some care? Yeah, absolutely. So our second case is focused around training um, and it, it basically um, is about a senior general surgery resident um, who is doing an elective in an LMIC uh, in a center that's currently short staffed. And uh, she's expected to perform, to independently perform surgeries overnight that she would not otherwise be allowed to do or to perform unsupervised in her or in a more well resourced setting. She does the surgeries anyways, and she justifies the decision is uh, as 
patients would not receive any care otherwise, or they would receive care from someone who is a more junior member of the team and wouldn't be as competent as her doing those surgeries. And so the discussion points are, what do you guys think about medical personnel who are doing procedures that are they're not otherwise certified or qualified to do in their home setting that would otherwise do them in a more under-resourced setting what if the need outweighs the 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 um the available qualified medical personnel and what happens if the patient dies how does this imply what are the implications of this on a trainee um, and what are the medical legal consequences so on. So this kind of ties up as, as Matt mentioned to the previous point that we uh, talked about, is any care better than good quality care? Feel free to jump in. Hi, I'm Anisha. I'm one of the residents from Indiana. Um, I think this is a very intricate question because I think it also asks us to look at who does surgeries in which part of the world. Um, because as surgery residents, we are taken through the cases by our attendings here. But in um, some parts of Kenya, we have clinical officers who have no formal surgical training who are expected to perform surgeries on their own in these community hospitals without necessarily having access to a physical in-person surgeon. So if that's what's culturally accepted, I don't know if it's incorrect for someone to come into that same setting and adapt, like we're asking ourselves to adapt in numerous different ways, not just to the resources, but also to the skill level that's expected to be there when you're taking care of a patient. Right, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, and so this, this does bring up the, the point of a, what standard of care should be accepted and based on what. And so people say, I've heard, we've had discussions where people say we should accept, the, the standard of care should be the same regardless of the geographic location, regardless of where you are. You should accept the same standards that you would perform on your patients, say for example, here in Canada, as I would in Kenya or uh, Tanzania, for example. Is that fair? Um, should we accept the same standards everywhere? Um, I just don't know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, this is Allie Martin. I'm, I'm a first year surgical oncology fellow at MD Anderson. I, um, I have worked abroad in a few areas, um, but I'm sure I have far less experience than many of the people on this call, but I, I, it just, there are so many parallels to this problem. I mean, we talk about it in a lot of different ways. I think about a lot of the conversations that we had around doing early detection versus screening in low and middle income countries. And a lot of the compromises that we make that are published about that are written into guidelines and that we accept as a standard for a lower resource setting. So I don't know, it's so hard for me. And then I wanna give autonomy to the institution, in this case, the LMIC and say, well, if this is the standard they have set and they're okay with the person that has my stated training level having this level of autonomy, that's what they have accepted for their institution. And they accept me as a person rotating there. But then again, was it coercion that they accepted me because I'm from a US institution? So then I don't know what the right answer is. And I will admit I have been in this situation where I was taking overnight call at one of the hospitals in Rwanda and I was the most senior resident. And we did call the attending for cases that came in, but the attendings didn't come until six in the morning, but the cases were going at one in the morning. And so it's a very hard problem. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I know that they accepted me at that institution and expected me to do what I was doing at my particular training level and accepted my qualifications for my US institution. So I'm not saying we did the right thing. I'm saying that is what happened. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the right answer is. It, that, that's such a complicated problem. And yes, if a person had died or had an outcome that wasn't what I had wanted, I would have been, 
emotionally devastated, but I don't know that I would have been more emotionally devastated than I would have been in the US if a complication happens because I take those very hard. So I, I can't, I don't have the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is. It's very complicated to me, but a very good scenario in that sense. I think that's the uh, good, maybe good thing or frustrating thing about ethics is there is no right answer there. Because the right answer depends on the person. So for you, from your perspective, Alison, like what you've done, you've done the best that you can in that circumstance based on your elective and based on your circumstances, right? And so who is anyone to judge you and say, oh, what you were not supposed to do this? Well, what would you have done otherwise? That was the expectation from you being in that institute. And so it, there, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but it is not an, it's not an easy situation. And, and in some uh, dis, uh, 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 forms where we've had this similar discussion, some people have brought um, the point of, of doing pre-departure training as a way to somehow at least minimize this, to, to basically have expectations clear on both ends from the trainees and as well as from the um, uh, receiving end or the host end and make sure that the trainee can fit in that environment and can perform um, comfortably and not outside of their comfort zone, if that makes any sense. I completely agree with that. And I did have that. And I could have woken up my mentor at home if I had felt truly uncomfortable. But that being said, they would have still had to come, you know, 20 minutes across town. So there would have been some delay. But I had that option and that was discussed. So that's what made me more comfortable. But I think having this discussion in detail, like I, we discussed what I thought my skill level was and what the expectation was of this medical center, but we did not have an ethical discussion about it. So I think having this particular ethical discussion is very important because maybe if I consider these points that you guys are bringing up, I would have made a different decision, maybe not, but it's worth having this specific type of discussion ahead of time. And I completely agree with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your for your input. This is very valuable to, to have someone who's actually been through a, a situation like this. Um, there's a comment in the chat box that says, I think this goes along with some of the previous themes of how global surgery impacts education, maybe creating or seeking collaborative efforts or uh, with trainees and surgeons in country, since they are probably more aware of their community's needs may make trips more ethical, sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. And there are many, um, there are a couple of my colleagues that are currently working on, as far as I know, on, on um, uh, pre-departure modules that are also, that have an ethics component to them that is a heavy one. Like not just, oh, here are the ethics, please make sure you think about them. No, but actually going through scenarios like this and discussing all the um, potential ethical dilemmas that they might face while being uh, uh, on their elective. Um, any comments on any of the other questions? Yeah, Nelian, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just have a question, and this is, could be more to Ali or, or anyone who's been in this situation. Do you think that it's a useful barometer for you, like in whichever um, setting you go to, to say that I will only get into a situation in which I can get myself out of it? To the sense that like, not not talking about skill level like what have i done what parts of a surgery have i done because a lot of times honestly from a trainee standpoint we don't do something from beginning to end all by ourselves we're not like when i tried to do that more and more i'm currently a third year resident so i'm trying to think about okay all of the sutures that i would need and i need to be the one to ask it but a lot of times like the attending asks for it and i just put my hand out and it comes to me right so like imagine if the attending wasn't there would i have actually been able to do the whole case position the patient appropriately and do everything from beginning to end right so um that's just the global thing but then also thinking about it i've tried to really with everything that i do in residency i say i'm not going to do something alone in that like if I get into a situation I can't get out of it and um and I just think that as an individual and like feeling comfortable and at peace with my decisions I would carry that line of thinking forward to wherever I go and it's kind of hard because it's nebulous and if someone's like well, okay well which cases can you do right um so I don't know if it was like Ali when you were in that particular hospital if they were if they kind of broke things down case by case, like what you actually felt comfortable with. 
but um because you can think anything even a laparoscopic case like if you're doing that all by yourself when you go in and like i don't know you get into the aorta or you get into the ivc are you going to be able to get yourself out of that situation on your own if yes then go ahead and do that lap appy on your own if no then maybe you shouldn't do that on your own because that is always like a real possibility that that would happen and then you'd be like oh man this patient's dying in front of me i don't know how to stop it so Maybe because I, 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 I really I, I'm I'm really enjoying this conversation and discussion because I think it's so uh, it's so perfect because it, it's similar to this this like the point of this case is that there is no right answer and again it is very subjective and we are trying to figure out what is what are the pitfalls and so Allison you're bringing up your point that you know it's really the exercise of going through these questions that's important and um, uh, Nelly Ange like to your point you know what knowing when you know what you can get yourself out of it is part of mastery of surgery and that's the issue like that you don't know what you can't get yourself out of until you're in the middle of it <laughs> and i can tell you <laughs> there is all kinds of crazy stuff that I'm, I'm like i'm never getting myself out of this <laughs> this is this boat is sinking fast <laughs> and uh and so it's it's incredible. Uh, the I think that's what makes and like Reem started that uh, surgery is a very different beast when it comes to some of the pitfalls that we get into because we can cause so much harm uh, in trying to do so much good. And I think that it immediately renders the the ethical situation a lot more important. Uh, so. You know, things as simple as, like you said, residents, you're like, go, go switch that trick. Okay, sure. They've switched the trick a million times. So let's say they take that trick out and it hoses and it's an anonymous art, like, um, vessel and it's just bleed, hosing out. And they, sure, they might know and have enough insight to put their finger in and lift up. They're lucky. Not the trick. Yeah, that's exactly how and you've been there. Uh, so so it's, it's stuff like that. Like we've all been traumatized by crazy stuff. But I think the the evolution of the training systems in a lot of these places has been the same, right? You start with trainees doing stuff on their own. Like my colleagues were operating as residents by themselves. The staff was at home. This is in Canada. And then as the systems mature and medical legal stuff begin to push back and all that, suddenly now there's responsibility for people to be in the hospital, then in the room, then supervising. And so then you lose some autonomy while protecting the patient. And that's the same level of, uh, of uh, evolution that's happening in all of the LMICs and uh, pl that plotted against resource availability and resource appropriateness and culture and the system stuff that you were talking about, Nelly like all the challenges of how do you actually afford care to all these people when there's too many and not enough resources and too much corruption and not enough um, you know, transparency. So, so it's, it's very complex, but I think what's our role in this? Like when you are a learner going into a place um, and somebody dies on you, is, is, this, is it the same moral distress as somebody who is a clinical associate doing this laparotomy in the middle of the night, doing a colostomy even though it's small bowel perforation? Because I've seen that like 10 times. And I'm like, what were you thinking? This is distal to the whole, but that's what they do. It's a colostomy because they know how to do a colostomy. And so, but that's like, what, where are we in that spectrum? And is one life saved? Does it ameliorate everything for everyone? It ameliorates it for that person versus does it prevent the system? Does it give it a crutch to keep limping along? And that's the other pitfall. And I think that's really where, where we have to be very mindful. I'd like to point out how First of all, all this the, the the discussion of ethics in 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 global surgery is uncomfortable for me at least. I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> like even just thinking about all these scenarios of people, I've never been through those kind of scenarios. I've, I have not also done an, an an elective in an LMIC, but just imagining like being through what what uh, what Allison has been through is giving me like atrial fibrillation. <laughs> it's very hard, and and it's very hard to. Um, I think the hardest thing is to have an insight into your own, like thinking, why am I doing this? Uh, what for, who is it for? 
what am I benefiting from this? Um, and so this is not easy. These are not easy questions to ask. And also asking a surgeon if you can do, can, how, what is your skill level? And how, can you do an appendectomy or not? And R1 will jump in of, out of ego and say, yes, I can. Of course I can, right? So it's, it's hard for us as surgeons to admit our, 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 you know, our incompetencies, not, not in a negative way, but at the level of training, we are incompetent doing things until we are. Uh, one day and and that that insight into what can I can't do is very hard is not an easy thing to do um any I just other wanted to yeah. quickly I wanted to just quickly sum it up and say during you know I was I lived in Rwanda for a year but I went back for a month to do a clinical rotation and, and to do a few conferences uh, after I'd been after I'd been gone for about six months and I only did one overnight on call and I remember it more than any night of probably my entire year living abroad um, in that particular country that is. And I thought it was okay because the, I was supposed to be a bonus member of the overnight team. And I was like the regular team was there. I was just there for bonus, but there was some sense that because I was the most senior person and I'm sure it's probably cause I'm American that they kept deferring to me over and over again. And I was like, y'all, I'm happy to help, but this is your, you know, I was along to help and to be like an extra person because I wasn't trying to scrub in and take cases during the day, but at night there were not that many people. So I was like, well, this will be good to get that experience. But man, it, it, it definitely impacted me. And so I, I, I can draw all kinds of little pieces of it that were it, questionable. I think. And so I would, I would definitely consider this differently. I will never be a trainee abroad again. I'll be a faculty member next time I go, cause I won't be able to go during my training. So I won't be able to relive this experience, but I'll be able to hopefully guide people better than I was guided just out of experience in the future. So I just thought I would share that particular part and all the different nuances that have come up. And I've relived that night. So many, nothing went wrong, but I've relived that night so many times because it was very emotional for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, I'd like to point out the comment that Brady uh, posted <clears throat> saying that although um, uh, while well, surgeons being required to stay true to, the, to their skill level, which should be simple and natural, but often presents an issue. Yes, it is. We have an ego as surgeons. We, yeah. <laughs> we hate it when someone tells us we can't do something. And we're like, of course I can. I'm going to do it. Even if I YouTube the video just before I go to surgery, I can do it. And so uh, it's, I, I'm going to be honest, I felt that as a trainee as well. Um, but, uh, but it's a very important skill. And I feel like us doing our work in ethics and global surgery has taught me to be, you know, to look into, it, have a better insight into myself and my own driving forces behind anything that I do, specifically in global surgery. Um, there's a point that uh, that that um, I maybe we didn't discuss that much, but medical legal consequences we don't think about those much, or at least from my experience discussing it with with others about medical legal implications of trainees being in LMICs. So, what if a complication happens? Who does that medical legal? Where does that fall into? Is it the, the local community or the licensing body in the resident's home country? What happens after? Matt, did you want to say something? Um, that is a wonderful question, but I also wanted to acknowledge that we are at nine o'clock and that's oh. where we were scheduled to end. Um, right. So what I will say is we can definitely continue on for whoever wants to stay, but if you have to go, it's totally okay. We would definitely love to do more of these in the future. I think we had great discussion and awesome participants. So thank you everyone for chiming in. Um, and I look forward to here to chatting about more topics. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things that we've thought about having individual sessions on were mm -hmm. things that we talked about today, such as short-term medical missions, ethics and research in global surgery, whether surgical NGOs help or hurt, which we touched on a little bit, um, who owns or is responsible for their post-op consultations and many other things. Thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, I'm sorry, we took, a, a, I didn't actually keep track of time. It's, it's such a good discussion. So I lost track of time, but I wanted to kind of briefly talk about uh, what we've done so far. I won't go through all these slides. I'll just go through our summary. Um, 
this is basically probably one of the most important outputs of our work. So what we've done as a group here at the OV is essentially try to formulate or come up with a draft framework on uh, ethics and global surgery to help guide to help guide our efforts. And as you guys can see, this this framework has come up from multiple multi level discussions worldwide with stakeholders from from all over the globe, really LMICs and HICs equally. And as you can see, the complexity and the multiple layers of considerations or overarching principles that start with the patient at the heart of any effort and then grows up to, to uh, the community level and, and so on. And so, and also we, we um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, where you are in this relationship or what lens you're looking through changes the decisions that you make. And so in every single level of, of any partnership, you have to think about who is, who are the stakeholders and uh, what effort is best to minimize harm as much as possible on every single level. And so hopefully in the future, near future, you're going to um, see our final publication of the ethical framework, as well as our process of developing it. Um, and um, as Matt said, and I would like to thank uh, my team, um, two of members of which are here today, Dr. Saleh and, uh, and Kai. And I'd like to thank everyone else who's on this project. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, if there's any more questions, we can stay in for five, 10 minutes to answer them. Otherwise you can uh, contact us on Twitter or email. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for all the comments. It's really nice. Okay, thanks everyone.